VHI One Plans. VHI Healthcare. When you need us, we're there. Terms and conditions apply. VHI Healthcare DAC trading as VHI Healthcare is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland and is tied to VHI Insurance DAC for health insurance in Ireland. Dreaming of a sunny beach break? Fly Air Arabia direct to Agadir, Morocco's premier sun destination. Flights from Dublin start at €59 Euro one way, including taxes. Book at airarabia.com. Air Arabia, where next? T's and C's apply. It's been a long road for the comeback, kid. In this week's Sunday Independent, Paul Kimmich speaks to Shane Lowry, who, in August 2016, blew a four-shot lead at the US Open and his chance to become just the sixth Irishman in history to win one of golf's majors. It's taken him almost three years to recover. The Sunday Independent, the complete read. Epic entertainment awaits. Switch to air today and get totally unlimited, super fast fiber broadband for just $39.99 a month. Plus the Air Sport Pack absolutely free and all on a simple 12-month contract. For more on this epic offer, call 1-800-500-300, go in store or visit air.ie. Air. Let's make possible. New customers only. $59.99 a month thereafter. Subject to availability. User experience may vary. Bundle activation fee may apply. For full details and terms, see air.ie. So you've just found out how easy it is to apply for a Bank of Ireland business loan? Well, it's about time. At Bank of Ireland, we understand the importance of your time, so you can now apply for a business loan in minutes and get a quick decision. For the loan your business needs, talk to Bank of Ireland. Call 1890 365 222 or search BOI Business Loans. Quick loan decision is dependent on receipt of all relevant information and documentation. Some applications may take longer. Warning, if you do not meet the repayments on your credit facility agreement, your account will go into arrears. This may affect your credit rating, which may limit your ability to access credit in the future. Security, lending criteria, terms and conditions apply. Over 18s only. Bank of Ireland is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. House. Digs. Gaff. Pad. Home. However you say it, we all deserve somewhere to call home. I'm Owen from Harvey Norman Little Island. This February, we're making homes with Peter McFerry Trust. We're fundraising to fit out 20 homes for people experiencing homelessness and all the money raised goes directly to Peter McFerry Trust. You can help by attending our fundraising events in store or by visiting harveynorman.ie forward slash making homes for more ways to donate. Help us reach our goal. Volkswagen Financial Services has a product that could transform your business in 2019. Interested? It can remove depreciation costs on your entire fleet, free up cash flow for your business, and with fixed monthly payments, your fleet costs will always be the same. Sounds good, right? It also has a low cost of entry, and if your driver needs assistance, they'll call us, not you. And this product's name? Leasing. From Volkswagen Financial Services. So whether your business requires one or 100 vehicles, our leasing product can benefit you. Before you update your 191 fleet, visit vwfs.ie forward slash leasing or call into your local authorised Volkswagen, Audi, Seat, Skoda or Volkswagen commercial vehicle retailer today. Terms and conditions apply. The Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. Hello there, you're very welcome along. So we're reviewing the uh, Sunday papers. We're streaming on Facebook Live as well. Good to have you with us on YouTube. We have Paul Rouse in studio from the School of History at UCD, Professor Paul Rouse, uh, former Offaly manager as well as of last year. And we have Declan Lynch as well from the Sunday Independent, a regular here, along with Paul, an author of Tony 10 as well, which is coming out in paperback very soon. Yeah, in about a month's time, kind of around Cheltenham time, uh, appropriately enough. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that's uh, looking forward to that. Yeah. Right, it's been well received. It has indeed, yeah. Um, it, it's, uh, it's been a real kind of uh, pleasure in the sense that, I mean, for Tony, it was such a risk to do the book, you know, uh, for several reasons. Mm. First of all, for, because uh, just going back into all that terrible stuff, into the worst thing of his life, just personally was, was difficult. And also, you know, you never know how something like that will be received, mm. you know. and. So for him, it's, it's been great, and we've j like it, it's done really well. I mean, literally, there were it was sold out. There was no, there's no more of them left out there after Christmas. So this is why they're bringing it out again. In in okay. you know, and we've just got a great reaction to it, and delighted with it. Really, you know. You wrote about it. You loved it. Um, I should say before I say this, I I don't know Declan. I met Declan once before, um, so I've I don't have any skin in this game. <laughs> I've and I've written this previously. It is the best sports book that I read last year and I think it's one of the best sports books I ever read and I think it is more than that, it's a really 
really, um, it, it shines a light on a huge issue in Irish life in a way that nobody has done it before. It's a brilliant book. Well, with that recommendation. Thank you. <laughs> Check it out. So um, we'll start with the headlines and then we'll get stuck into various stories. Uh, Phil Good factor, Phil Foden scoring for Manchester City against Newport yesterday at Rodney Parade, a 4-1 win. And then Manchester United fans, you'll see here, Manchester United are prepared to pay David De Gea 90 million over his next five years. So 350 grand a week sterling is what they're willing to give David De Gea to keep him. It's what he's asked for and they don't think it's unreasonable. They think he is one of their most important players. So it's uh, been talked about as the largest basic pay package. Obviously, there's image rights and various other bonuses which go with contracts. But just in terms of basic pay, this is bigger than the Sanchez contract, bigger than the Pogba contract. So um, David Haye in for a big payday if he decides to accept that. Back of the mail on Sunday, Dream Killer Foden, Amund on target. That's Borg Amund, the Carlo man, Amund on target. But there's no ethic of shock as Man City march on. It was a 4-1 win. Sun Sport, I've got to man up. This is Alexis uh, Sanchez, who is accepting that he is not playing well enough for Manchester United. Interestingly here, they have his wages at 505,000 sterling a week, which is more than I ever saw it reported as. I always thought it was in the realm of 300 or 350. So uh, that just uh, was noticeable. Back page of the uh, Sunday Mirror, roll of the die. So it seems, according to John Richardson, on the back page of the Mirror, that Old Trafford Chiefs have already opened talks with Juventus over a potential move for Paolo Dybala Juventus. So that would be good news for Manchester United. Uh, there's talk of Lukaku going the opposite direction, by the way, in that deal. And more transfer business. Back page of the Star. Uh, João Felix, 19 years of age, plays for Benfica. It seems Manchester United and PSG are in for him. He's been talked about as the next Cristiano Ronaldo. £105 million is the uh, price in that tug of war. Then the Sunday Independent, completely different <laughs> tone, really, when it comes to um, all the transfer stories. It's Mullinocta's Aidan McGilligas, distraught after they were beaten by Dr. Croaks yesterday. Although Eamon Sweeney making the point that in Currafin and Croaks, we have two of the really great football teams in this country, and you could do a lot worse on Paddy's Day than to go and watch these football. Like Currafin and Croaks make Gaelic football look like the most beautiful game of all, is how Eamon Sweeney starts that piece. And then finally, it seems Ole Gunnar Solskjaer had a three-hour meeting with Ed Woodward. It seems it's happening regardless of how this week goes. Um, he, he understands, uh, Solskjaer, that he will be the next Manchester United manager, has the total support of Alex Ferguson. Uh, there was a three-hour meeting with uh, Woodward, and that looks like it's happening. A uh, four million per year deal as United boss. That's the back page of the Sunday World. So there we are. There are your back pages. Lots to get through on the Sunday papers this afternoon. We uh, might start, good awfully man that you are, with uh, Shane Lowry, a two-page spread with Paul Kimmage. Definitely the biggest interview across uh, all the Sunday papers. Uh, really, in uh, broad terms, it's Shane Lowry who recently won in the Middle East. It was a huge win for him. Three years on, almost two and a half years on from August 2016 when he had a four-shot lead going into the final round of the US Open and things um, went awry for him. So the comeback kid is how this is done. Big two-page spread there. Uh, great picture of Shane and uh, Kimmage sat down with him at Pebble Beach last week to reflect on the horror of losing his four-shot lead at the US Open and what the fallout has been like. So I said, um, I don't know Declan and I don't really know Shane Lowry. I met him a, a couple of times at Offaly football matches very, very briefly. Um, he is, I, I am entirely biased here. I have nothing but respect and regard and admiration, lost in admiration for, for, for Shane Lowry, for the way he conducts himself, for the way he goes about it, for his open, openness in what he wants to say. Um, when he wants to say something, he says it. When he wants to do something, he does it. But he's um, a hugely impers impressive person, apart from being obviously a brilliant golfer. Mm. I happened to be in America in June 2016, working in Boston, when he had that lead in the uh, in the U.S. Open, and I I've probably argued a lot with people since then who said he, who've talked about how he choked and how he you know he blew up. Mm. I don't think he choked at all. I don't think he blew up. I think it comes down to it, he just didn't play well when it came down to it. Mm. 
and he, he started steadily. He didn't start brilliantly, but he started steadily. Mm. And he was there going into the, the into the last seven, eight holes. He was in and around the lead. Um, there was always going to be a charge coming from, coming from somewhere. Yeah. He'd never been in that position before. Mm. He fought hard. And when it came down to it, he just did not play well enough mm. in, in, in a stretch of holes in the back. And he's totally open about how it happened, um, what happened to him. And it's a, it's a really interesting interview. It's a really interesting story. And he talks about things that, that he might have done differently. Yeah. Not least on the uh, second, it was a drivable par four. He scrambled a par on the first. He felt very nervous. He talks about feeling very nervous on that morning. And he scrambled a par, which was good. And then on the second, it's drivable par four. And he was driving the ball brilliantly, he said. And everybody, you know, he looked back at the coverage. Everybody was dri taking the chance of driving the ball. And he didn't drive it, even though he was driving the ball really well. And he ended up making a bogey, and that rattled him. And he bogeys four of the first 10 holes. You're still tied for the lead on 12. And he says, yeah, but when you start with a four-shot lead, that feels horrific. He says, I've watched it back on TV. And there's a quote he has where he's talking to his caddy, Dermot. Everything seems to be happening so quick. And I couldn't understand why. And before I knew it, I was standing on the 18th, and the tournament was over. That's his recollection almost of the whole afternoon. He three-putted the 14th, the 15th, and the 16th. On the whole choking um, point, you don't think, um, I don't think I choked, he says. You don't? Long pause. It feels like it, says Paul Kimmage. It probably looks like it. Does it feel like it? He says, I don't know. What are you supposed to feel? Did I play the last 10 holes and four over? Yes. But it's one of the toughest golf courses in the world, one of the toughest scenarios you can face. I was hitting the ball well. My putter left me for nine holes. That's where I lost it. I don't think I choked. I just didn't go out and win. That's his perspective on it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's great stuff. It's a, it's a really brilliant interview. It's just a kind of classic Paul Kimmage interview because he, he taught, he taught, first of all, he goes, you know, the, like, what's the big story about Shane Ross not winning the US Open? There's lots of big so, stories about Shane Ross. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, I beg your pardon. <laughs> Shane Lowry. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear God! Shane. Easy to confuse the two. Like, Very similar yeah, types. They're, they're so they're never heard similar. about the US Open. <laughs> they're extraordinarily similar people, as we all know. How anyone could make a mistake like that. So, um, it, it, the, I think that the thing that sticks out here is um, just how traumatic it was yeah. for him. Uh, like one way of looking at it is. You know, well, okay, he didn't win the US Open, but he did so well to get there. It was his first real time in contention for a major, and a lot of people would not feel so, but it really was a huge blow for him, it seems, at the time. And, you know, Paul Kimmich really teases that out. And at the point where they're discussing, like, what the meaning of the word choke, mm. you know, uh, and there's a whole psychology to do that. It's like saying the word the yips, you know, God for simply don't mention the word because it's so uh, damaging and, and there's, there's so much weight attached to it. The Lord Voldemort of golf. It think. is, yeah, you simply don't say it. Uh, so they're, they're going in, they're jousting there about that. Did, I, did he choke or did, or did he not, you know? Mm. But there's almost a sense of it being, this being therapeutic, this interview. Eventually it gets to the point where he reaches rock bottom with his caddy. The, he parts company with his... Caddy, I think Dermot Byrne. Yes, Dermot Byrne, yeah. And uh, it's like the British Open during the summer just yeah. gone. And that they have a kind of a falling out ultimately. Things are going really badly for uh, for Lowry and I'm not actually because people will be interested. The first round at Carnoustie, I got off to a decent start, made a couple of mistakes, and then me and Dermot Byrne as caddy, we tried to have a chat after the round, it turned into an argument. I threw my toys out of the pram, I left the golf course, didn't do any practice. He came up to the house that night and we finished it. It was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. And Neil Manship, his coach, caddied for him the next day. Larry says, yeah, that was wrong. Um, Kimmich says, not to have waited until after the tournament. And Larry says, yeah, stupid, I regret that. But another thing with me is I hate confrontation. I can't deal with it. Mm. So he almost couldn't bring himself to face yeah, him. Yeah, he has the, the classic day. structure of, like, you know, he, 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 he has the trauma. Uh, he goes through a bad period. He hits the ultimate rock bottom. And then he returns with this great win, um, you know, a few weeks ago. There's a quite a poignant moment where um, Kimmich says to him, earlier on in the piece, before they discussed the breaking up of that caddy player relationship, which was basically a decade long. I spoke to Dermot last year, he said, for a piece I was writing on caddies. He said the thing he remembered most about your second place finish at Oakmont was driving to New York the next day. He was crying so hard he had to stop several times. He ended up missing his flight. Larry says, I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I thought that was really hard to read, actually. And there's an, I'd, I'd throw in beside that, that on the Tuesday morning after the event, uh, after we lost on the Sunday, Shane Lowry talks himself about how he woke up on the Tuesday morning and just absolutely broke down. Mm. But the question is, what was he doing on the Monday? And what he was actually doing on the Monday was he was at Royal Dublin Golf Club 
and he was doing uh, a golf clinic and had to play 18 holes with the sponsors H- HNA of the French Open. Mm. So he had to go, actually go to work the next day on the Monday yeah. in the most prosaic manner possible. Yeah. With his going on in the background, having just imploded on, uh, in, in, in all his dreams crushed in those last nine holes and, and he goes to do this. Mm. And that relationship with, with Dermot with Dermot Byrne, it must have been. It obviously they were very, very close, and and the, the, the fallout from that must have been pretty hard. But he, 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 the way he talks then about how his his brother came on the bag for him mm. later on in in twenty seventeen, and things are moving on. You can see, like he's not trying to blame anybody else here. He's he's acknowledging straight out that he didn't behave particularly well. Yeah. Mm. With 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 Dermot Burns and like that, again, that's admirable. Mm. I, th- I think that it strikes me as well. Just on the, the point of like yeah. how badly it affected him. You see, like Shane Lowry is a top class golfer uh, and w- you know obviously abundantly talented. So he wasn't like a guy who get who, who kind of gets a lucky streak for a few days and will never we were, you know have any chance of winning a major again. We've had we've had those guys. You know the guys who who kind of lead the British Open after one day. I think it's a great, it's a Peter Jacobson or something has a great quote about as a, the, the slums of Chicago are full of guys who led the Masters after the first day. You right. know? Uh, and if, if a guy like that suddenly gets a chance to win, you know he'll never remotely come near it again. Whereas, you know, um, Shane Lowry is, is like a top-class player. Mm. So, uh, again, it kind of, it's, it's, it puzzles me a little bit just how devastating it was for him. Four-shot lead, though. Know? Well, Four you know, shot lead. he will be there again. You know, I mean, his, you know, someone of that talent since. would be have a fair chance of being there again. They would, like yeah. That, you know, You'd have a reasonable uh, expectation. Better than would. some other people. But he mean he may he may never he may st- he may even win a major yeah, and, and, and may be, not yeah, and may not lead by four shots going That's into the right. final round again. Of course, yeah. And, you know, and, uh, it's easy for me, kind of. Well, it was easy. sitting here. <laughs> well, of course, <laughs> you know? it's easy for us all. Yeah. Uh, he turned to uh, Jerry Hussey as well. Sports psychology, definitely not for him. It seems. Um, he talks about how he's not on Twitter anymore. I love Twitter, but I don't use my account anymore. Brian Moran, his manager, does that for me. I can't deal with the negativity. It's just poison. People slagging you off and telling you how shite you are, and then other people licking your arse is something you don't need as well, <laughs> which is a pretty good summary of, I would yeah. think, being a sports star on uh, Twitter. Well, yeah. well, he doesn't need to be on it. No. So wh- why would he bother? He checked it the morning of the US Open as well. Uh, it seemed, um, Kimmage even says to him, it sounds like from a psychological point of view, you did everything wrong the morning of the US Open because he was uh, checking Twitter and he could see the whole country was blowing up because he had shot a 65 in the third round that morning. It was an early start and everybody knew he was four shots clear. And also his dad was there and it was Father's Day and he got like, pretty emotional about what it would mean to give the trophy to his dad. Like Kimmage says to him, I'm surprised you could lift a club. But that's the way he is. Like He can, he can only be himself... Um, as he as as he goes on like this, if it suits him to look at Twitter, look at Twitter. If it's mm. if you're trying to win it for your dad, win it for your dad. I mean, I, I know that that doesn't it doesn't suit a whole load of people, and it might be entirely outside what sports psychologists will expect you to do. Yeah. But so what? Yeah. Uh, I like it that this quote sticks out as well. Um, Larry says, I don't like change. I'm not a big person for change. I have the same manager and the same coach and had the same caddy for nine years. I wish more people would say that, you know. Uh, change, I mean, from politicians sticking it as a slogan of change, everything change. There's this automatic, everything to do with change is regarded as good. Yeah. Whereas there's also an argument that the change that a lot of us need is to change things back to the place before they were changed. Mm. Do you know what I mean? If we could do that, it might, might help, you know. But uh, just to come out and say, I don't like change, is, I think, refreshing in an odd sort of way. <laughs> um, so that's Larry. That's on pages two and three of the Sunday Independent. And it's great now. Look, he's after winning at the start of this year. It puts him back in the world's top 50. He says that he knows Padraig Carrington's not going to pick him. You'll have to qualify for the Ryder Cup. He says, yeah, I know. They're not going to give picks to, picks to rookie these days. And Larry says, yeah. And he'd be slower to pick one of his friends as well because he'd be setting himself up for a fall. So I he also he thought he should picked. have been picked. It, it, it could have been, was it maybe the, the Ryder Cup before last? When Darren Clark was captain. Yeah, and he wasn't picked, right? Mm. And there was some talk that he, he might have been picked. I think it would have been great to pick him. I think he would have been a brilliant Ryder Cup player. Just even, it, it might have given him a real That was the year of the, the Open. Time. That was the year of the US Open, wasn't it? That was 2016. Yeah. Uh, he said himself he only needed to play half decent after the US Open to be in the team, but he went yeah. off a cliff. But uh, even so, it's the sort of thing that maybe it could have sparked yeah. something in him, you know? Yeah, I, uh, I can't, can't remember who Clark picked. He certainly picked Lee Westwood, which blew up badly in his yeah. face. Um, I can't remember all the picks. <laughs> On, uh, as we um, park the golf, 
At the complete other end of the spectrum, back page of the Sunday Times, David Walsh is writing about Matt Kuchar. Kuchar's caddy should have been paid the going rate. I suspect lots of you have seen this story. In short, uh, Matt Kuchar, one of those um, smiley, easy to like pro golfers, as Walsh calls them, was playing in Mexico at the Mayacoba Golf Classic last November. He hadn't won in four years at that stage. His career earnings are 46 million, we should say. But so he used a local caddy in Mexico because his own usual caddy was unavailable. Um, or Ortiz, David Ortiz was his name. So they agreed that he'd give him $1,000 if he missed the cut, 2000 if he made it, 3000 if he finished in the top 20, and 4000 for a top 10. They never actually discussed what they would do if he won. And then he went and won 1.26 million. And Kuchar gave him $5,000. Uh, the going rate for a full-time caddy who's on the road, which it would be 10%, i.e. $100,000. Uh, Kuchar gave him 5000 Thought this thing would go away, and it's after blowing up in the last two, three months in just the most unbelievable way. And Kuchar had a statement during the week where he kind of said, look, 5000 for this guy, you know, um, I think I kind of think someone he got in his car. He makes two hundred dollars a day usually. Five thousand dollars <laughs> is a really big week, is what Kuchar <laughs> said this week, as a way of trying <laughs> to justify happens, it. You know, they'll only wait. You know what? They, you know, there's no point giving these guys money. You know, they don't know what to do with it. Wow. Like, uh, uh, but, the, the reaction to that was so horrific. Uh, who knows what sponsors got involved or who came involved? But Kuchar uh, released another statement saying, frankly, I made comments that were out of touch and insensitive. He's agreed he's going to give Ortiz mm -hmm. the fifty thousand dollars. Uh, though the point is, uh, and this is Walsh's point, you know, the question is, should you give Kucha credit for rectifying the situation, or do you remember him for his uh, miserliness? And Walsh, I think, rightly says, it's the latter that is going to uh, stick in but the mind. But it, it's just uh, symptomatic of a culture, right? Um, like, we all love the old golf joke, you know what I mean? Sure, like we, we sport, watch it, yeah. you know, and all that. But the PGA, particularly, the, the top, the, you know, the, the culture, the corporate culture of the PGA is vile, vile beyond belief. It's the kind of sporting wing of the far right in America. Uh, you've got the NRA, the GOP, and the PGA. Yeah. They're vile, right? And this is so symptomatic of, of a culture, you know, that is in which I think the Colin Kaepernick, the, the take a knee, I think one professional golfer, sort of ranked number 857 or something, supported him or, or made a statement in mm. support of him, right? Um, it, this is the culture that these guys are coming from. So it's as n normal as breathing for Matt Kuchar to be <laughs> issuing these, these kind of disgraceful, disgraceful um, sort of view of the world, really. And even when he gives him the fifth, why not give him the hundred grand, uh, for God's yeah, sake, yeah, you know? Yeah. I mean, how hard would that be? So he calls a penalty on himself. It's not much of a penalty, really, is it? He's calling on himself. I mean, he's... Uh, uh, he's calling maybe uh, half a penalty. Mm. Uh, you know, he should, it maybe it should be a two-shot penalty and he's only calling one shot. Do you, you know, know what? Go all out to try and redeem yourself and say, do you know what? I've made 46 million. I've yeah. made such a mess of this. Here's the million. That's, what, that's, ex that's exactly what I was thinking. I, yeah. I, I, think, I think he looks mean and there is nothing attractive he's about mean. He still paid the now. minimum amount. 50,000 is totally. now the next new minimum. <laughs> <laughs> he'd been dragged through a ditch to pay it. Yeah. It looks shocking. Um, it's it's incredibly revealing though of attitudes, yeah. and it's a, it's a really serious. And, and David Watts does ask the question: Do you remember him for rectifying the situation, which he doesn't really rectify, by the way. He kind of half rectifies it, or re remember him for his miserliness? Miserliness. I don't. Know, I think the answer is easily the second. Yeah, I mean it's now a byword for being cheap. If you're playing golf with someone and they don't buy the coffees that they have to buy because they lost the round, they're going to call the Matt Kuchar. Kuch, Kuch, yeah. Yeah. But I think Kuchar as well, like, doesn't he come from a, a really well-off family? Like, you know, they're kind of, finan again, sort of in financial services, shall we say, you know? So, um, like, I guess, you know, his, his whole life, uh, he would have formed the view that there are certain people that, you know, have money and other people don't, yeah, and that's yeah. fine. There's the help. Uh, yeah, uh, it's a complete mess. Um, I saw someone tweeting that when the commentators now usually explain that the crowd aren't booing, they're just saying cooch, who knows anymore, mm. uh, you know, but uh, yeah, it's, it's just unbelievable. So he's given the $50,000, but no one feels good about it, I don't think, anymore. You know, he can't feel good about giving the $50,000. Um, so that's um, the golf done with. Declan Rice uh, has been a big talking point all week. I suspect people have pretty much reached the point of having their uh, fill of it. So. 
There's a few, though, writing about it in the Sunday papers. We won't spend too long on this, but we'll give you a sense of what people are saying. Uh, Eamon Sweeney, uh, I thought it was a very strong piece, stop this sneaky pursuit of players. Uh, he says, the story Declan Roy is a very simple one. It's the tale of a young Englishman who, believing, believing he wasn't good enough to be capped for his own country, threw in his lot with Ireland at underage level. On discovering that he was much better than he initially thought, he switched allegiance to his native land. His decision was neither dishonourable nor surprising. There's no need to complicate things with waffle about the conflicted soul of the immigrant. No need to try and find someone to blame. And then he goes on to talk about how Ireland are chief practitioners when it comes to luring over players born elsewhere. Uh, other countries do the same thing. None do it to the same extent as the Republic. Perhaps that, that is why there's such a strong desire to pretend that cynical pragmatism is in fact something else. That this uh, stretching of the nationality rules to the very limit is a kind of Mary Robinson candle extended to the immigrant masses. To continue this pretense, it would, be hel it would help to just nab one player who was good enough to play for England and opted for us instead. Deccan Rice was that player, which is why his defection is a psychological blow for reasons besides his considerable footballing ability. Uh, the argument that there's some in irreducible core of paddiness which makes you essentially Irish even if your grandparents left the country 60 odd years ago strikes me as a dubious one. There's something humiliating about the Rice saga um, and talks about Grealish as well. He says that uh, they both show that no top class English born player will ever pledge his senior future to Ireland. It is our fate to function as a kind of consolation prize for the Redmonds and Bamfords of this world. Yeah, I mean... Uh, Does he have a point? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, um, uh, Tommy Conlon, my favourite bit, uh, you know, that was added to the, 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 the rich mixture of the week, because he was just referred to John Delaney as Jilted John, yeah. uh, which I think <laughs> brought something to it. Uh, I think there's a link as well with the whole, everything about Gordon Banks. Uh, you know, when people are talking about Gordon Banks playing for St. Pat's against Rovers when he was nearly 40, right? Mm -hmm. Just that culture of great immortal footballers who were still found like 500 quid to be quite handy at, towards the end of their days, right? Who were completely not looked after, who lived in an era in which, you know, I, I know John Giles is always the, like he's the most measured of men, right? Mm. The one thing that really still gets him going is that whole issue where someone like Wilf Mannion was getting 20 quid a week while 60,000 people were coming through the turnstiles. It's gone completely the other direction now, okay? But like, I'm still okay with Wayne Rooney getting the money rather than, say, Martin Edwards. Yeah. So it hasn't actually swung in exactly the opposite direction. It's, it's, a, it's still a better direction. But the, the maltreatment and the, basically the abuse of talented people by the, uh, the people who ran football for so long, uh, you know, it's, in, it's instilled in football, there's a, in the DNA, in the very kind of core of the professional footballers now, is the fact that you never do anything other than for your own self-interest. You never, you just don't do things for sentimental reasons. Mm. And, and I think that is, it's such a deeply held kind of position that why we're even thinking that someone like Jack Grealish or Declan Rice will do otherwise. We're like children, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, the world changed. La uh, you know, once the likes of Nobby Styles was selling his medals for that in 1966, all that stuff, that, these scandalous situations, right? You know, in the professional footballer, uh, you know, uh, uh, an iron, you know, core was developed that like, you know, you get nothing for sentimentality in, in, in football. Mm. And uh, you always go with the the, you know where the money is. You you always go for the kind of um, you know for self interest. You know for your your greater self interest. And um, so it's so normal that he's doing this. And um, and you have to see. And once you see it in that in that history, just oddly enough that Banks died this week. And uh, yeah. you know again, it was probably struggled to make a living most of his life. Make a living. I mean, just pay the bloody yeah. gas bill or whatever. See, I, I I totally understand people will be. Uh, a bit put off by the fact he played three times for Ireland. It leaves a terrible taste and you kind of think he shouldn't have done that if he had any uh, sense that he wasn't going to see it out in the long run. But I think we do have to look at ourselves here. So like Stephen Hunt is making the point, for instance, that uh, he saw Rice playing for the first time for West Ham when he was in the reserves 18 months ago. And so we've missed an opportunity, as in we could have almost got him in the, the team sooner. And, and Sweeney... Um, advocates a position I totally agree with, which is, you know, there is something 
uh, really sneaky and pragmatic about what we're doing. So he says on, I guess, Stephen Hunt's point, that sneakiness, it's obvious to all in, it's, it's obvious in all those calls to give Rice a competitive cap as quickly as possible so that he'd be stuck with us for good. We were essentially trying to hoodwink a teenager in the hope that he'd make a hasty decision before realising the extent of his own ability. It was shabby stuff. Declan Rice copped on to us before it was too late. Fair play to me, fair play to you, me old China. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if it works out like that. So, I mean, if you look back, say Mark Lawrence is a famous example. Yeah. Who I think it was Alan Kelly, the goalkeeper. Got him early. Uh, yeah. At, at Preston. Preston. Yeah. And and but nobody. I mean, Mark Lawrence was okay with that throughout his career. I mean, he was. I'm sure Declan Rice would have been okay yeah. with it. But is, is it, it right yeah. that we're doing it? Yeah. No, or, or certainly uh, we, we can't. Don't know. We can't I mean, feel hard done knows by. for sure if someone is going to be a great star mm. or not. So there's always that doubt. I think at a certain stage, and like the the blame is absolutely with Martin O'Neill and Roy Keane, like that they didn't see that, and uh, like you know if. If you give him the cap he plays and it doesn't become an, it's not an issue anymore you're not taking advantage of him I don't think it's your job you know what I mean if, the, if you're an international manager yeah. uh, you have, your, your job is to do whatever is in but the it, best interest isn't of, there something the, you know, no with the, of the country isn't there something wrong though let's use Sweeney's uh, word of hoodwinking a teenager you well, know like so yeah. say we say Declan Rice had made a competitive mm. start for Ireland when he was 17, 18 yeah. and then deep down he regretted that on some level for the rest of his life. Would we feel great about the fact that we had swept well, no, in I quickly? Don't think so. no, I, I, accept, I know exactly what, what Eamon is saying there, but I, I, someone like Declan Rice, he's not messy. Do you know what I mean? It isn't massively obvious that, that he's going to be a really top-class player. It, it, you know, there, there is an element of doubt at a certain stage there. And uh, if you're the manager of, of Ireland, like your job is to see promising players it's, and, and have them playing for Ireland. So like, that's their fault. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, I don't think you're 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 taking advantage of them as such. I mean, they, they, no more than anybody would have thought that you were taking advantage of Mark Lawrenson when, as it happened, he developed into this marvelous player. But uh, and maybe playing international football helped him in in that sense, you know. So it's just that the issue doesn't arise anymore. It just it's not an issue, yeah. you know. And I don't. You very rarely have examples of that of someone who just finishes up playing with the wrong or, or regrets it deeply you know because it's so hard to know if That's someone that, is, is that really we know good. of i mean declan yeah. rice if he had played for ireland and had a sterling career mm. no pun intended he would never have come out and said after you know on winning his 50th or 100 irish cap mm. it's been great and all but to be honest if i'd known yeah. things were going to go so well i probably would have played of england so we don't know how sure. players uh, feel privately what's your take on it all um i think i i'd go a little bit wider than just soccer i would look at the the manner in which international sport operates, and at its margins, it's a farce. And we're talking here about soccer and how the FAI do their business and how the management of the Irish soccer team do their business. But what about the rugby team? Mm -hmm. And what about the rugby football union, who has spent more than a decade or a decade identifying Southern Hemisphere players to come and play for Ireland? Mm. So three years in the country, makes you qualify to play at this I know the rules have now been changed to five but only yeah. recently but the rules as things have stood mean that the Irish rugby team is essentially ha uh, kind of supported by a series of players who've been brought from the southern hemisphere who don't qualify for citizenship for five years but are identified as, as being Irish in sporting terms for three years mm. Now we're happy when this goes against us to, to scream and shout, and I'll give you an example. In, in, in 2016 in the European Athletics Championships, Fanula McCormick was beaten yeah. into fourth place, and she, she's a brilliant runner, yeah. and she was rightly raging after the match, or after the race, and she was raging because she'd been beaten by a Turk called Yasmin Khan into fourth place. Yeah. Yasmin Khan wasn't Yasmin Khan a few months previously. Yeah. She was actually a Kenyan woman yeah. who continued to run and train and live in Kenya, but ran for Turkey as Yasmin can. I mean, the rules are a farce. And people, there are two basic points here. The first is that international athletes or athletes are well capable in very many instances of making compromises around identity and nationality that will allow them to compete at the highest level mm -hmm. and to earn money. That's the first point. The second point is that if it works for the benefit of a team, supporters of that team are generally speaking willing to, 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 to accommodate that. Broadly speaking, there's no real disagreement on it. Mm. There is though. I think there is disagreement. I, I don't think anybody likes the residency situation in Irish rugby, but I, there, there reaches a point where once the team are playing, 
you have a choice then. Well, do I not support the team or do I support the team? And if I'm supporting the team, do I abstain when Bundyaki scores a try? No, of course you don't. Like, it's difficult territory then. You know, are you going to see the team as corrupted by uh, the examples you're talking about and say, well, I'm just not going to support I think it, I think there is no evidence of any decline in support for the Irish rugby no. team. It's a broader point I'm making. That's, sure. So the point I'm making is that people accommodate themselves to success. Yeah. And on the specifics, uh, look, I agree with everything you're saying there. Like the wider point where we are in the margins, I mean, international competition is far really, at the moment. In, in but on, on the specifics of rice, what do you make of rice? I, I, um, I, the last time we spoke about this in this studio, I, I think I didn't just predict, but I, I laid out clearly that he would definitely stay with Ireland, mm. that there was no doubt that he would leave and go back to England, that he had made, nailed his colours to his ma- the mast, that he needed space the kind of space that anybody might need. But of course, when time, when time drifts along, he's entitled to, to, to change his mind in terms of his growing up. Yeah. Now, within the rules, he should not have been able to change his mind. Within the rules, once you play for a country, that's, that's it, really, when it comes down to it. That's the way it has to be. Mm. Now, for him, identity is a really, really complex thing. And you can feel more than one thing. He can feel, and I think he laid it out really well in the statement. It's a yeah. brilliantly cra- crafted statement. He had fantastic advisors. His media people are brilliant. They put it together really well. Mm. And it is right. He's, 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 he feels himself to be a proud Englishman. Yeah. And at the same time, he has an Irish heritage, which he's proud of. And I, I think that exactly encapsulates the situation. Mm. And I would think there's another element which isn't in the statement and isn't widely commented on, and that is that when he was 15, 16, 17, his dad was incredibly excited that his son was playing for Ireland. And that, of course, is related to his own parents, uh, Declan Rice's grandparents, and the kind of general sense of feeling around that. And there is no doubting the sincerity and pride that was felt around that family feeling. But there's a difference between what a 16-year-old boy thinks, and what a 19-year-old boy, he's moving out into the world, mm-hmm. he's making it successfully in the, in the Premier League. I take your point, Declan, that he hasn't proven he's going to be brilliant. I'll be really surprised if he's not a top, top, really seriously, he's not a really big club in the next couple of years. Stephen Hunt says that there's every chance Man United will buy him in the summer. I think that's right. Mm-hmm. I, th- I think he could be exactly what Man United need um, in that team. And he, he just, he looks at class apart when he plays. Yeah, no, he's, he's a fine player, there's no doubt. Well then let me, so that's, that's Rice and both of you then, the FAI policy, which uh, brings in James McCarthy when it works, mm-hmm. you know, Scottish born, and blows up in our faces on occasion, i.e. with Rice and Jack Grealish. This policy of scouting cross-channel and finding players with Irish heritage and saying, come on over, see how you like us. Mm. Do you agree with that? Is that okay? Is that within... No, you're shaking your head? No. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I see the world is, is, a, is an increasingly complicated place. Like, and, you know, the, the, a lot of the, sort of the idea of nationality comes from a time when a lot of people would never leave the country they lived in for the whole of their lives. Do you know what I mean? So, like, there, are, there is a lot of mixed nationality, a lot of, sure. you know, the, just as the world be, becomes just the people, you know, um, uh, travel more, basically. Mm. You know, so it's, that it, it is to some extent a reflection of that, I think. You know, that, you know, it is more normal for people to... Uh, you know, to have someone who's entirely Irish in the sense that both of their parents were born and reared in Ireland, all this kind of thing is uh, is is not the kind of um, is not as as automatic as it used to be. You yeah. know what I mean? So it is a response to, in s- some sense to that. I think just the nature of the world is such. I mean, it's, if you look at the not French a wholly team, cynical the, exercise. No. Well, look at the French national team, the, fr- sure. the football team. You yeah. know what I mean? Uh, like. Uh, it, it's their 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 backgrounds, their nationalities are vastly more complex than they used to be in the days. Whatever Just Fontaine or whoever used to play the, the guys who used to play for France, mm-hmm. you know. So, uh, you know, it, it does ref- reflect that in, in a sense. And uh, you know, I don't know uh, how you respond to that, except in the way the way the rules are. Uh, I suppose accommodate that, and and you just get on with it then, you know, and try not to uh, uh, make massive errors yeah. <laughs> along the way. Agree. You know? Um, n- not fully, no. Um, I think in the 19th century, for example, uh, you look when when international sport is being made, and you look at the formation of the first Irish teams. There were more Irish people living in the cities of Boston and New York than there were living in Dublin. There were more Irish people living in London and Manchester than there were in Dublin. So I think these flows are not new, mm-hmm. and um, I think what is entirely new, though, is 
essentially the identification of people to come and play for the country where, where they haven't lived or they don't have a, a really meaningful connection of heritage. And the problem with the rules is, I think, it's, to actually de design those rules is incredibly difficult. Yes, yeah, yeah I think so, yeah. And, no, that's true. And, and, and what you're relying on is a certain integrity yeah. uh, amongst the people, but as people know when it comes to winning sports matches, yeah. sports competitions, integrity is pretty often cast aside and willingly cast aside by people. Yeah, it's a great way of putting it. Yeah, that is where we are exactly. We'll take a short break. We're reviewing the papers here with Paul Rouse and Declan Lynch. The Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. Welcome. Dial 1 if litter in your area is a problem. Dial 2 if you're concerned about the cost of sending your child to college. Don't Dial call and three complain. If you're worried about Take home a TD. Coming soon to News Talk. Your call is important to us. It's been a long road for the comeback kid. In this week's Sunday Independent, Paul Kimmich speaks to Shane Lowry, who in August 2016 blew a four-shot lead at the US Open and his chance to become just the sixth Irishman in history to win one of golf's majors. It's taken him almost three years to recover. The Sunday Independent, the complete read. Start your story at Woody's. All Dulux two and a half litre standard interior colours, two for 40 euro. All flat pack furniture and bar stools, half price. And save 60 euro in the Triton T90 SR shower. Now 229 euro. Woody's, for all homemakers. T's and C's and exclusion supply. Thanks to Mitsubishi Motors, you'll find out how much shopping fits in your new 191 Eclipse Cross SUV because you'll get a 500 euro done store shopping voucher when you order your new Eclipse Cross before February 28th. And since it's Mitsubishi, you'll also get an eight year warranty to go with your stylish new SUV. So talk to your local Mitsubishi dealer today. Terms and conditions apply to Eclipse Cross 500 euro voucher offer. See MitsubishiMotors.ie for more. At Beacon Hospital, we fix broken hearts. We provide complete cardiac care from our rapid access cardiology clinic to routine procedures and complex open heart surgeries. One in three Irish people die of heart disease. So if you're worried about your heart health, get checked and protect yourself from a broken heart. This is modern medicine. This is Beacon Hospital. Visit beaconhospital.ie. GP referral required. Your mum thinks you're great. Oh, well done, love. Your dog thinks you're great. <coughs> and if your credit record is excellent, we think you're great too. <coughs> Haven Card is now offering Ireland's lowest rate on loans over €20,000. If your credit score is great, improve your home, upgrade your car, have that dream wedding. The choice is yours. For more info, go to avancard.ie. Limited time offer. Lending criteria, terms and conditions apply. New applications only. Information correct as of February 1st, 2019. See bonkers.ie. Avancard DAC trading as Avancard is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Hastings Seven Heavenly Hotels in Northern Ireland offer so much more than a place to snooze. In Belfast, you could lounge about in luxury at the Europa's Piano Bar, check into calm at the Culloden Spa, delve into the indulgence of afternoon tea at the Stormont, or experience enchantment in the Grand Central Sky High Observatory Bar. Seven Heavenly Hotels. Endless sublime stayovers. Book your celestial stay for spring. Find the best rates at HastingsHotels.com. Why would I tell you to enter an illegal street race? You've got no chance. You can't drive like me. Your car is nowhere near fast enough. And you're never going to win because I am. You see, I'm about to become a father. And that comes with certain responsibilities. So, if you did take part in this race and somehow found yourself ahead of me, put it this way, it wouldn't end well for you. Curfew, a Sky Original production, starts 22nd of February on Sky One. Race your way free. Dave loves his sleep. Not that he's getting much. But because at Energia, we power all the street lights in Ireland, we're the power behind Dave's latest night drive that's helping little Amy nod off. Finally. And because we also power Dave's home, we're the power behind the warm welcome from his electric blanket when he gets back. If he gets back. Energia, the power behind your power. The Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. 
Now you're welcome back. We're here with Paul Rouse and Declan Lynch looking at the Sunday papers. So we'll move on to some GA pieces. And actually on that front, there's a piece on the Off The Ball website, offtheball.com, uh, which is well worth a read, an interview with Paulie McNamara. Uh, it covers quite a few things. He was one of the hurlers who did play under Justin McCarthy when there was effectively a Limerick strike on. And he's uh, very honest about what that experience was like and the loyalty he felt to McCarthy and uh, the atmosphere in the county at the time. And it's worth checking out, Paulie McNamara, and it's on the Off The Ball website. So if you're a Limerick fan, if you're looking for some GEA uh, pieces, that one is well worth checking out. And it's at offtheball.com. So it's an interview there with Paulie McNamara. You'll find it on the home page. Uh, there were pieces that um, you lads picked out as well. GPA, clearly a well-run body, but are their demands sustainable? Uh, Philip Lanigan is writing here about the amount of money, frankly, in the GA and where so much of it is going. And then Colm O'Rourke just wants to burst any bubble of enthusiasm. Don't get too carried away by February's phony wars. Uh, yes, it was good, he says, of Dublin against Kerry. Both sides went at it, but it was talked up into something more than it was. Epic battles only happen when there's more at stake. Maybe, it was a, maybe it's a natural reaction when there are so few good games. Uh, the weekend was balanced by the other Division 1 matches ranging from poor to rotten in the case of Galway Monaghan. So thank God for small mercies. And he does say, most of the games in the last 30 years were raw enough. We're not blessed with too many great teams or great skill either. The essential change in the game has seen it become uh, one of keeping possession with fewer contests for the ball. So that's O'Rourke not getting too excited about what we saw on offer in Trilly last year. And then uh, the Philip Lanigan piece stems from a fairly informal briefing that Paul Flynn, now the CEO of the GPA, gave during the week where he did uh, fly the kite maybe that the GPA would go after 15% of GEA commercial income which uh, was valued at just over 2.94 million in 2018. Um, now it's probably just the beginning of no negotiations as well, it, you don't get the impression they're going to go hard at it but Lanigan uh, starts talking in his piece then about the madness of the intercounty spend generally uh, broke into the 25 million mark in 2017 when all the counties were totted up together. Where do you want to start here Paul? Um, well, the GPA, do, it, the fifteen percent of GA's commercial income is already in place, uh, yeah. valued at two point nine four. What what Paul Flynn was asked about was specifically um, gate about gate receipts, yeah. which are currently excluded um, from the arrangement. And I think that that would be on on twenty eighteen sec um, ticket sales worth around a million euros yeah. or so more. Um, it's a very good piece by Philip Lanigan. It's a very fair piece. He quotes what John Prenty, the Connacht Council Secretary, calls uh, the madness of an inter-county spend that brought 25 million in 2017. And I think the difficulty is for the GPA, when they look for more money, is that they're not great at factoring in costs into... They, 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 they don't want the costs of running things subtracted from the revenue which is earned. And that's really a really difficult and very problematic thing. The, the GA's balance sheet is ultimately supported by a vast voluntary endeavour across the countryside. And that's an undeniable fact. Mm -hmm. Now, as things stand, intercounty players get very, very good expenses, fine gear, fine. They're well looked after in almost every county and at almost every level. And that's fine. But there has to be a limit to that. And there particularly has to be an issue around prioritization. Mm -hmm. And Michael Dignan makes exactly the right point in the piece above Philip Lanigan's piece, mm -hmm. where he talks about where are the GPA when it comes to talking about the club structures. Mm -hmm. And the GPA's answer is, well, we're there to represent county players. Well, every county player is a club player. Mm. And ultimately, the single greatest problem, we're not going to go down this road of talking about it, but the single greatest problem within the GEA is not more money being given to the GPA, mm. it's the calendar of play. And the GPA has singularly failed to come up with any significant proposal as to how that calendar should be fixed. And you have a situation whereby inter-county competitions for 2019 began in 2018 at the beginning of December, mm. and they will continue until just about September of this year. Mm. It's a calendar of play which is ridiculous. It drives costs to levels which are unnecessary and it stops 
play significant play for more than ninety eight percent of the membership, mm. and I think that's the that, I think that's a key. If we move then to to talk about Kerry Dublin, which I think is probably something people might be more interested in. It was a really interesting reaction to that match. I watched the match. Um, I thought I thought it was a good game. I didn't think it was quite the classic that it was. It shows you how desperate people are for yeah. a decent game of football. I thought Kerry were, were the better team. I thought they were well the better team on the night and they deserved to win. I would imagine that you would want to be extremely careful about reading too much into it. However, there are two things, I think, for Dublin. Mm. The first is that they have lost some incredibly brilliant players and replaced them with players who are very, very good, which means that they are slightly more vulnerable than they were previously, number one. Number two, mm. there is an issue with a high ball into their full back line, which they are going to need to resolve. And there is an issue about who plays midfield with Brian Fenton. Mm. On the um, GPA for a moment, and O'Rourke finishes off his article saying, it's great that we may and he says the word is very much May. We may see some opposition to Dublin dominance this year. Uh, there's a lot of improvement, improvement to come from Kerry as well, and he, he says they'll need to improve a lot, even on that performance last week. On the GPA generally, have they been a force for good over the last decade? In my view? Yeah. Um, I don't think anybody can legitimately criticise the fact that inter-county players now get proper expenses and proper food and proper support for that. Mm. But as a force for good, I wouldn't see them. They're not an unequivocal force for good, far from it. I think there is an element of empire building in how they go about it, and it has led to a general skewing of commercial priorities within the association. It is emblematic of it, and they have driven it. So they're not just emblematic of it. They have also driven it in a particular way. And ultimately, they are... The people who run the GPA are representing a very small sure. percentage of the GEA's membership. Mm. And there is a story, a narrative which is being created around the sacrifice and the great indentured slavery of the inter-county player that I don't really, I don't really get it. Mm -hmm. um, to me, to play inter-county football and hurling is an enormous privilege. And I think it's viewed as such by a huge number of people who play it, certainly the ones that I know. They're incredibly decent fellas mm. uh, and, and, and incredibly decent women. The ones I know from UCD who, who play at this level, they, they are very committed, they're often very committed to their clubs as well. And they're having the time of their lives in very many respects. Now, where there are downsides to it which need to be looked after, and I totally get that, but I think there is a skewed prioritisation in the narrative. And there is a sense around this that has been built around it that it can be fixed with money, that everything can be fixed with money. And I don't see it like that. Mm. And so, in specifics, what's the biggest critique? What should they have done more over the last decade? Well, there's a very simple... There was a great report last year by Ailish Kelly on behalf of the ESRI when she set out all of the challenges around the, um, that inter-county players face. She did also set out all the benefits that come from it, but in the middle of it, she raised the question about the amount of training that was done, yeah. its purpose and its practice, and that the key relationship in an intercounty player's life was with an intercounty manager. So I would really question whether the GPA has looked at that idea, has looked at that issue. Mm. And there's very little evidence that they have. Mm. Should they have done more to give the Club Players Association a leg up, got behind them, got involved with them? They could have driven that through, couldn't they? I think that they have walked away from the club player and that means of course walking away from their own membership in respect of that part of their existence which is the club player. Mm. They have repeatedly expressed this view that they're there to represent inter-county players mm. but inter-county players are also sure, club sure, players. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think this is just flying a kite isn't it? Oh it's kite flying, kite flying. There is, there is, they don't need that extra million. There is absolutely no way that the GEA if it's in its right mind at all, yeah. having raised ticket prices, disgracefully by the way, mm. raised ticket prices disgracefully, there is no way that they will now hand over a million of euros of that to, to the GPA. Mm. Yeah, I was surprised, I didn't, I didn't know, I don't know was it the best thing for the GPA in coming out saying we need more money, like do they really need another million? You know? Well they're doing well out of Boston as well, every year. Run a dinner, make a million, mm. bring it home. Mm. Yeah. And what uh, sense did you get from the Offaly players when it came to their interaction with the GPA? Did they feel like it was there for them? Did they feel like it was a very valuable organisation for them? I, I have to say I don't know. Right. 
um, for the couple of months that I was doing it, it was pedal to the floor. Yeah, we were focused on playing football. Top of your agenda. It wasn't. Uh, I think. I think that's in a in a longer, in a longer term span. Of course, that would then become a conversation. But I think from the time that I was there, I mean, I had nothing but good relations with the players that I was dealing with and very good relations with the county board and there were very good relations between the off the between the footballers of Offaly and the Offaly County Board okay. while I was there. So I, I I can't see that there would have been a problem. Yeah, okay. On the um football front there's a standout piece on Jackie Carey in the Mail on Sunday. Philip Quinn has done mm. this. It's uh, hundred years since his birth. I think that's the reason off the top of my head. You have it there in front of you, Declan. Yeah. An anniversary. Na- yeah, no it's a, it's a great Piece. I mean, he's, he's this extraordinary figure, Jackie Carey, Johnny Carey, Jackie Carey. Which uh, is it? Uh, well, uh, who cares? It's just Johnny. Johnny. <laughs> Let's call him Jackie Carey. Yeah. Uh, and um, it's been called both in various. Quarters, I think it he? was it that he was uh, Johnny in England and Jackie in Ireland, or or the other way around. I'm I'm not sure. But uh, so who was so for people and there'll be unfortunately plenty listening who, who may never even have heard of Jackie Carey. Who was he? Well, mainly he was a uh, great. The star for Manchester United uh, in the kind of throughout the forties, uh, like the, the Second World War, you know, interrupted his career yeah. hugely. Uh, uh, if, if that isn't I know, a terrible uh, reflection on the Second World War, there, yeah, that one of the great knock-on effects was that it disrupted Jackie Carey's career. But uh, it's um, uh, he, he really managed Ireland. He managed a lot of other teams as well. He was this kind of iconic, uh, a kind of complete professional player who looked like almost an authority figure, like he was balding, you know. This is the image I always have in my head of him. He was like a, you know, a a mature person, Uh, even when he probably was about 18. He he just always seemed to, one of these people who was always bald and uh, who was just a a, a great, he's remembered particularly for the fact that he actually signed up with the King's own Hussars during the war. He he went, uh, for an Irish person, that would have been, I'm sure, quite controversial at the time. But Eamon Dunphy is quoted here as saying, uh, you know, uh, the Jackie Carey's own quote was, a country that gives me my living is worth fighting for. Mm. He said, ahead of his posting as a sergeant to Algeria, Egypt and Italy, where he became known as Carey-O when he guested for local clubs. And uh, Eamon Dunphy is quoted, it was a shining example of courage and a noble thing to do as Carey could easily have avoided it. Mm. Uh, it was hugely important for Irish people in England and those that followed him. As captain of Manchester United, he did nothing but good for Ireland's reputation. Um, and uh, he, he, he was manager of Ireland then at that bizarre period when the team was picked by the, committee. the, f- the big five, yeah. as they were called, which could conceivably include like a butcher from Sligo or someone. Now, someone who had no uh, knowledge of f- football at all, mm. other than he kind of liked it. Mm. Uh, and these guys would pick the team and then Jackie Carey would say, now you manage it, right? Mm. The team would come over on a, on a Saturday evening or a sun- or you know, even on the Sunday morning, or you know, so like they would meet up in the Gresham yeah. in the morning, and Jackie Carey would say something to them like, "Fizz it about, lads," right? Literally, that was his fizz it because he had no time to do anything else, and they would fizz it about, and um, then uh, they would go home usually defeated. Uh, he also, in his later career, he was manager of Everton, right? Uh, when he uh, became forever associated with. Uh, uh, a, a phrase in football. He was sacked in the back of a taxi, right? Famously, the, the, one of the directors of Everton was that he was in a taxi with Jackie Kerr and he sacked him in the taxi, right? And since then, uh, if a manager is sacked, his taxi for whoever, uh, Margot Silva. Is or that where it yeah, comes that's from? Yeah, that's where it comes from. Perhaps his most lasting contribution of all is this was Jackie Carey oh was the, the man who was first sacked in, in the back of a taxi. So that's, that's where that. it comes from. I've heard that phrase forever. It's just such a football phrase. Yeah. That's where it comes from. Uh, no, it's, yeah. it's a great piece of Philip Quinn. Uh, interestingly, the picture that uh, adorns it, it's like a, you know, Manchester United and there's a player called Alan B. Chilton. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Good Lord, what a name. Isn't that a, a great name? I'd never heard of this before. Alan B. Chilton. Yeah. Um, so he was, I mean, he was, he was a captain under Matt Busby for seven yeah. seasons um, before the Busby Babes and everything. Mm. And it was... Um, oh, yeah, he was Footballer of the Year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they won the league, they won the cup. Yeah, so um, they won the league in 52. Yeah. Because um, they'd finished runners-up for the previous five seasons. But it, it opens amazingly. So just after the 1958 Munich Air disaster, uh, Jackie Carey at this stage is the manager of Blackburn Rovers. Uh, but he drives to Matt Busby's house when he hears of the... 
uh, crash. And then it says, Carey appeared on television as the Manchester United spokesman, and then he flew to Germany to be with the survivors. Uh, you know, so it shows the standing is held in that when this unbelievable moment happens, uh, Carey is still sort of such a part of the fabric at the club that he becomes mm. the spokesman and flies out to Munich. And as you said, he was uh, player of the year, player's player of the year by a landslide in 1949, the runaway winner of the Footballer of the Year award. He pulled in 40% of the votes at the time. Mm. He received the award in London on a Friday and then caught the overnight sleeper with Busby for a game against Newcastle the next day, which United won 1-0. Carey was man of the match. Um, and in 49, he led the Republic of Ireland to that famous 2-0 win over England at Goodison. Mm. Uh, John Giles is kind of quoted in this and basically says that everyone knew one name and that was Kerry's. Kerry was the man, he was the star, went to United, had, su had such um, pace and skill that he started off as a striker and Busby even played him at fullback as well. Great control. And there's a brilliant anecdote from a game in 1953 when he goes and goals against Sunderland. Um, there were no subs left, or allowed rather, and Kerry had to go on goals. And instead of bouncing the ball, he soloed it as if it was a Gaelic football as his little pre-kick routine to everybody's amusement. They weren't too sure what he was doing. Mm. So, uh, Jackie Kerry. Yeah, Je Jeffrey Green of the Times is quoted here and uh, it kind of sums it all up. He said, No man was more deserving than Johnny Kerry, a model captain and among the most complete and versatile footballers in history. Mm. At first glance with his thinning hair and thoughtful expression, he looked older than his true age, but there was no doubting his maturity. From the moment he let his side out, you got the impression he was bringing a pack of schoolboys who were to be put through their pace under his supervision. There was something in his measured stately tread that engendered an instant feeling of respect and authority. Yeah. He played for the North as well, did he? Um, he did. He won He won 29 caps for what became known as the Republic of Ireland and won nine caps for what became known as Northern Ireland. But when he played for them, both teams were known as Ireland. Okay. Um, do, you want, do you want the lecture? <laughs> I'll take the abridged notes. <laughs> I would take the full lecture. <laughs> the clock is killing us. Conor O'Shea is waiting patiently to take a phone call soon. Yeah. So I'll take the, the spark notes. In 1922, the Football Association of the Irish Free State has split away from the Irish Football Association, which had been based in Belfast. For the next 35 years, both associations field international teams called Ireland. Mm both of whom claiming jurisdiction to pick players from both parts of, right. of the Ireland. So when Jackie Carey played for Ireland uh, against England, he played three days previously uh, for England against... Uh, the, against for, for both Ireland teams within three days against England, basically. That's what they, so uh, off across his career nine times, yeah, right. he played for them. And, and this continued until the 1950s, this tradition of... Being able to play for for both and parts. Did of lots Ireland. of players do it? Yeah, there's a lot. There's more than thirty players. Was uh, it a contentious thing to do? It was seen to be fine, and that's what I'm saying about identity and yeah, people yeah, yeah. being willing to make compromises. He's and from he's from Dunleary in uh, Dublin, so he. Was yes, but also deal. he's also getting paid to pay to play ah, right, to okay. play a football match um, at a time when the the wages being earned by professional footballers are brutal so most of them have summer jo have summer jobs so they, they work as carpenters or, or painters or whatever during the summer mm -hmm. and in, in, in the case of it, it ended in the 50s because um, Northern Ireland began to, in, to compete in World Cup qualifying campaigns in the 50s just as the Republic had done from the 1930s and FIFA basically this rule became you couldn't represent two different teams in the same competition. Yeah. So an agreement was brokered. Okay. Very interesting. Um, so that's pages 88 and 89 of the Mail on Sunday. It's a really good piece and it's the anniversary, 100 year anniversary of his birth. He was born 100 years ago this week in Dunleary and started off at Home Farm. Uh, that's Philip Quinn there. He went to United in 36, 1936. Well actually the mystery of whether in England Carey was always Johnny though the English, the English press dubbed him Gentleman John. Right. So this is in relation to, is he Johnny or, or Jackie? He had a song on the terrace at Old Trafford. Hello, Johnny Carey, you can hear, hear the girl, all the girls cry. Hello, Johnny Carey, you're the apple of my eye. You're a decent boy from Ireland. <laughs> There's no one can deny. You're a harem, scarum, devil may care him, decent Irish boy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. That's good. Uh, not quite the terrace chant of today. No, though. not there quite. Um, right, we're running out of time, unfortunately. I knew this was going to happen. It was a slightly tight one today. Um, we may not have time to get to Fergus Slattery's piece, which is uh, interesting on a few fronts. 
but it is worth mentioning Noel McKay before sticking with football and Manchester United connections for a second. Um, this is on page four of the Sunday Times. It's a really good idea. This is the guy, Noel McCabe, scout around Dublin. This is the guy who spotted Roy Keane in that very famous game, Fairview, when um, they got walloped 4 0. And as I only found out recently, Stephen Kenny was playing it. Right. Uh, just to add to the myth of this game, and uh, Keane, as he said himself in his autobiography, I played for myself, even when I knew the game was lost, I kept going. I was like a man possessed. He was angry because the bus had been late and it was ramshackle rovers. So it was Cove against uh, Belvedere. And um, standing behind the goal in Fairview, it says uh, Noel McCabe realised he had discovered a buried treasure. Mm. And uh, that's how it kicks off. So there's a great picture of Noel McCabe here. Were you familiar with Noel McCabe going around Dublin back in the day? Not really, no. I mean, like, the, um, I've... I'm aware of him, like, but what comes out in that as well is uh, the great saga of like players who didn't sign for Liverpool, mm. um, which is what uh, you're focused on. Yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> like Peter Schmeichel, I think, uh, offered to come over and and um, uh, for free, like, to do a, a trial. But they said, "Ah, no, that's okay, that's all right." Uh, but uh, the one that's added to it now, I didn't realize John O'Shea. Mm. Uh, Steve Highway came over to see him, and uh, they were Liverpool were going to sign him, and uh, but they didn't like uh, the fact that uh, Nolan K points out that because O'Shea was like very tall, yeah, you know, it seemed that like he wasn't jumping for for a ball that 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 Highway felt he should have jumped for, you know, and. I guess the point McKay was made that O'Shea didn't need to jump for it because he was tall enough. But on that basis, they decided not to sign him. So one more added there to the, to the list. Robbie Keane uh, didn't sign for Liverpool of his own volition. Yeah. He decided that he needed to start off uh, earlier on. So in that one article, we have two more uh, added to the uh, extraordinarily long list of really good players who didn't sign for Liverpool. Yeah, the ball comes in the air. O'Shea six foot two, six foot three. He doesn't jump for it. Highway was sitting alongside me. He did that in Melwood too. We can't take him. Mm. May I explain how why difficult might it be to teach a fella to jump if you felt that strongly about I, it? I don't think that's what they're saying. Go on. I think they're saying. Not I think the point enough. is that he's not aggressive enough. Yeah. They wanted he what they were looking through. for. Something. Yeah. Like they were looking, Ruddock, maybe. They didn't you know. think. They didn't. They wanted him to play as an attack the ball, regardless of the circumstances. Well, he says, half. Joe Corcoran, who has since died, he was the Man United scout. He got Ferguson to have a look at O'Shea. The rest is history. Yeah. Well, uh, the uh, Jay Spearing, he was quite aggressive, right? <laughs> and he was the only player I think that the Liverpool Academy produced for about ten years after after Michael Owen and Stephen Gerrard. So, yeah, aggression, yeah, is a good thing. But yeah. there's other things as well, you know. Yeah, uh, Curtis Fleming. He says it's funny, isn't it? Well, uh, I think this is brilliant. Yeah. I think it's brilliant because he's he's he, he's making the point about how subjective this is. Yeah, and that you know what that some per, somebody can see something that other people can't. And he said he looked at Curtis Fleming and he just couldn't see any use in him uh, at all. And Curtis Fleming went on to play well, two three hundred games for Middlesbrough, yeah. and ten caps for Ireland, ten caps for Ireland, two six experiences for Middlesbrough. He made a great career for himself. I never rated him. I knew all about him. We just didn't send him for any trials. Yeah, I, I, I still don't think actually he was much good. Almost on the point of saying that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a nice point with so with, with Keane, because um, Keane talks about McCabe in his book a good bit and, and you know sings his praises and said that he felt uh, like McCabe was a very genuine man and that he could trust him right from the start and met him at the Ashton Hotel near Houston and send him on his way to Forest. He only met him once afterwards, he says. Um, there was a friendly against Dundalk and they were running for a bus. Ronnie Fenton says, hurry up, Roy, we're all going. So I just said a quick hello, best of luck. Uh, that was it, and he never, never really saw him again. But then, at the very end of the piece, uh, when McCabe was in hospital, he got a get get a get well card out of the blue. Roy Keane, which is a mm. nice touch, isn't it? Yeah, you hear quite a few of these stories of Roy Keane. If you like, being privately quite a different person than what a lot of people assume that he's like in in his public persona. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, I've been told to wrap. I tell you, we'll take a very quick break and I'll, we'll come back in one second and just polish off the papers. One second. Join that conversation. Text us on 53106. Texts cost 30 cent. Every brand has a story. Some are built over decades, others over centuries. Discover the German car brand, meticulously engineered over 120 years to bring you our cleanest, most efficient engines yet. Discover Opel. Come and celebrate Opel's 120-year anniversary event at your local Opel dealership. Choose your perfect 191 Opel, then choose your preferred offer, like 0% PCP or HP Finance, a guaranteed minimum of €3,000 scrappage, or three years free servicing. Opel's 120-year anniversary event. From now until 
February 28th. Visit your Opal dealership for more. Opal, the future is everyone's. Lending criteria, terms and conditions apply. Higher purchase agreement provided by Bank of Ireland Trading as Bank of Ireland Finance. In Germany, we don't simply wash our cars. We cancel them. We don't merely hose down our driveways. We cancel them clean. Construction and farm machinery? <laughs> you can be confident they get a cranceling. Kranzel Power Washers are 100% German-made and engineered. Distributed in Ireland by C.A. Galvin Limited for over 35 years, Kranzel machines are renowned for their quality and are built to last. Kranzel have the power washer to suit your needs for any domestic, industrial or agricultural use. Visit kranzel.ie for your nearest dealer. It's been a long road for the comeback, kid. In this week's Sunday Independent, Paul Kimmich speaks to Shane Lowry, who, in August 2016, blew a four-shot lead at the US Open and his chance to become just the sixth Irishman in history to win one of golf's majors. It's taken him almost three years to recover. The Sunday Independent, the complete read. With over 1,200 car dealerships and 1 million car ads viewed every day, it's no wonder Done Deal has more car buyers and sellers than any other website in Ireland. Find your next make and model on Done Deal. Discover and drive. Dreaming of a sunny beach break? Fly Air Arabia direct to Agadir, Morocco's premier sun destination. Flights from Dublin start at 59 euro one way, including taxes. Book at airarabia.com. Air Arabia, where next? T's and C's apply. If you've had a mortgage for years, or you're a first-time buyer, why pay more for mortgage protection than you have to? VHI now offer cover from as little as €7.58 per month. It's easy to set up or switch over the phone. Call us on 1890-444-444 or search VHI Mortgage Protection. €7.58 per month is based on a 30-year-old non-smoker for a 20-year term and mortgage protection of €158,000, including a 10% customer discount and a 1% insurance levy. Terms and conditions apply. VHI Healthcare DAC trading as VHI Healthcare is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland and is tied to Zurich Life Assurance PLC for VHI Mortgage Protection. Football Index is reinventing football betting. You can buy and sell the world's top players. Their value may go up and down, but it's not over with the final whistle like a regular bet. Football Index, reinventing football betting. Start building your portfolio today at footballindex.co.uk or download the app now. New customers only, minimum deposit and conditions apply. Gamble responsibly. Can I get a receipt? Yep. This is it. After years have been rolled up within an inch of my life, it's finally happening. I'm free! There you go. What? Oh, you might have me for a minute, buddy, but not for long. Where's it gonna be? The wallet? The bag? Or the pocket, eh? There's your first mistake. This won't hold me for long, pal. Receipts have a mind of their own. Go paperless and manage your travel expenses online with My Taxi Business. Make the smarter choice at MyTaxi.com. The Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. Now, welcome back. We're reviewing the Sunday papers. We have Paul Rice and Declan Lynch here in the studio. We're just, um, well, we were just finishing off chatting about Noel McCabe, the scout who spotted Roy Keane way back when, and you brought up Peter Schmeichel. And then, Paul, you just mentioned in the ad break you saw Peter Schmeichel's first game for Yeah, when Manchester Peter Schmeichel, United. I was living in Manchester um, at the time when I used to go to stand in the Stratford End, and all the home, home matches. Uh, was it easy was, to get a ticket back then? Or yeah, you like? just walk up. I didn't have a ticket. Just walk up and pay at the gate. Wow. Six pounds, six pounds fifty. So we're talking early 90s there. We're talking 1991, 92, that time. Walk up and get a ticket on the day? Yeah, no problem. Man, that is extraordinary. I used to go. I used to actually go down there early on the Saturday. I'd meet people from oh, who were over from Tullamore. To, every week you'd run into somebody uh, at the ground who was going over to a game. So I saw... Uh, so that season matches, he was just he was just magnificent. Even in the warm ups, he just brought an energy to the warm ups that was the mark of, of just a different level mm. of player. It just just really and demanding of people around them, setting the tone around the place. Mm. And he got the crowd going mm. because he warm up in front of the Stratford end every time, and you knew he was totally up for it. Were you in Manchester long enough to see the period where the walking up and paying in changed? No, I was gone. I was gone from there. I haven't been back since. Yeah. It's definitely changed since. Then I wonder when it did change. It couldn't have been long after 1992. No, you must have got the last halcyon days of being able to wander up. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, yeah, like according to legend, that not only this Schmeichel, he as a young player wrote to Liverpool and uh, and asked them, could he please have a trial? Yeah. Please, because he's a huge Liverpool fan, and he begged them and he begged them, and then they said, said no. Uh, it, I think Sh- Sh- Cantona, well, isn't according to legend, yeah. Cantona was offered to Liverpool, who uh, very wisely, you know, turned that one down as well. T- just that those two decisions, right? Not just of what it might have meant for Liverpool, but against United. Like, is that the whole difference? Maybe it's a six-point swing. That's for sure. It's, it's, it's some six point. It's a six-year swing, yeah. isn't it? You know, six years of your life. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And then the knock-on to get over to another six years. It's like an eighteen-year swing, really, <laughs> isn't it? You know. Um, yeah. You were saying that you uh, are taking it one day at a time at the moment. Yeah, with uh, as regards winning the league this year, it's that's all any of us do. Like uh, we we are exhausted trying to work out the various uh, permutations. Uh, but m- my own view is, if the, if you could boil it down to one thing, oh. it's Firmino. If if uh, Bobby Firmino kind of recovers his best form consistently. I think that one thing would uh, would make all the difference because any time Liverpool are not good, it's usually he's not he's not he's such an important player and he's such a brilliant player mm. that uh, it, it, maybe he's not being played in the right position or whatever. Like he he needs to kind of it's like Salah is in the middle and he's almost he's in the way, you know, that he 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 gets the ball, he's not sure wh- where to go with it, right? But he's he's so good. I think Klopp always has regarded him as crucial. You'd all, you'd often hear yeah, him like, yeah. at, at times of saying the. First First player he mentions is Firmino. Mm. That he he sees him as so important to the whole way the team works. That if he, like you know, we we could we could talk about many permutations. That's the one thing I think that if 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 he gets it, if he comes back into form consistently, then I think we could go close. You know, <laughs> that's all I'd say. Okay. There's um, bits of rugby. There's not a huge amount, obviously, given it's a gap week in the Six Nations. But one piece that caught our eye: Fergus Slattery. Uh, Fergus Slattery remains as combative as ever when talking about the modern game and Ireland's current dip in form. Peter O'Reilly talking to Fergus Slattery, who turned 70 uh, last Tuesday. Uh, Phil Bennett called him a remarkable player. Uh, he was one of the standout players on that uh, Lions tour of South Africa in 74. Uh, he said, Slats used to do sprint training with the backs on tour. He'd be annoyed if he finished second or third. Such a competitor, a good footballer too. Uh, an open side flanker back in his day, played in 15 consecutive Five Nations Championships, which is one more than Rory Best, and is still combative, as Peter Riley says. On the England game, a disaster. Our performance was absolutely crap. On the victory over Scotland, fair, but no more than fair. We made lots of mistakes. Like our scrum half could have run behind the post when he scored. Why didn't he? We missed the conversion, and it could have been critical. What the F? says um, Slattery and O'Reilly says that he was in Edinburgh last week and on the Friday he addressed a large crowd at the Wooden Spoon charity lunch and he told them he had the utmost contempt for the Scottish and Welsh unions for their failure to support Ireland's World Cup bid and also for their refusal to send teams to Dublin in 1972. So um, he is a man comfortable in his own opinions, um, Slattery, which is no bad thing. He definitely, um, the trip to South Africa during the apartheid era comes up, he's definitely not... um, him and Hine, or um, you know, drowning in self-doubt over the decision to go. He was one of the players that went. Obviously, he went um, with the Lions. He said, "I was anti-apartheid. Uh, I felt the best way to change this was through communication. For instance, I captained the Lions uh, against the Proteas, the first non-white side to play the Lions. They had an 18-year-old centre. Uh, seven years later, when Ireland toured there, he became the first non-white to wear the Springbok jersey. That would have really hurt the uh, broader bond, the inner sanctum of Afrikanderdom." Uh, on these tours, I often disappeared and explored the townships, always brought a journalist with me in case anything went wrong. He talked about going to see um, uh, several places with Colm Smith of the Irish Independent. I genuinely wanted to understand what the whole society was about, how the whole thing wasn't working. Um, the decision of those players to go to South Africa around that time, uh, I wasn't around at the time. Certainly there was plenty of rancor at the time, but it, it hasn't aged well. I don't know, do you put much stock or validity in that argument that he makes? I think um, he makes his case very well but the reality of it is that I don't doubt by the way that Fergus Slaff- Slattery is utterly anti-racist and Sorry, I don't I, I, in fairness to him I should read that I was anti-apartheid and I felt the best way to change things was through communication just to emphasise that yeah I don't doubt for a minute that he was against the apartheid yeah. regime nobody I mean, you, you can't you can't begin second guessing that but 
the reality of it is that for all that he makes a good case for himself, he's found himself on the wrong side of history on this one. And it's all very well saying that I wanted to go and find out about the society and I wanted to go and do this. The Irish anti-apartheid movement had been in, in existence since the middle of the 1960s, since about 1964. Mm-hmm. There had been a series of protests every time the South Africans had visited Ireland throughout the 1970s. Nobody could be in any doubt about what was going on here. There was a broader call for sporting isolation of these and this was particularly focused on the Springboks team and the idea that the Springboks team was in some way evocative and supportive of that regime. It was emblematic of that regime. The protests here were immense in the 1970s. There were also, by the way, and you can find this in the National Archives, there was a series of exchanges between the government, there were file after file of this, of exchanges between the government and the Irish Rugby Football Union, in which government succession of government ministers are basically trying to say, look, don't do this. Don't do this. There's, yeah. this, there's, there's no need for this. And the IRFU are basically saying, we'll do whatever we want, and we know best, and this is sport, and sport goes beyond the politics of this particular time, and rugby transcends everything here yeah. and it's a very convenient position to take but if uh, the way I the way I'd frame this up is very straightforward a, a group of people who were working in Dunn stores in the middle of the 1980s mm. knew enough to go on strike because well they were, they were a strike it ended up being a lockout over the fact that they wouldn't handle South African produce yeah so that's how deeply this had percolated around society mm. So it just feels convenient to mm. argue it in, in, in that way. Now, again, I don't say for a minute that he wasn't anti-apartheid or that he wasn't anti-racist, but when you have a broader movement mm. calling for you not to offer any support mm. for this institution, for this racialized society, mm. then... It trumps your own personal desire to go and learn about a country. Maybe I go think and, so. Maybe go and do that not under the banner of the Irish rugby. And given how articulate Fergus Slattery is, what if Fergus Slattery had come out and spoken so strongly and so critically around that time? How transformative would that have been? Mm. The um, 1981 tour was especially contentious. I just was, was briefly looking back there. So Charles Hawley wrote a letter uh, to the RFU saying, don't go on tour. And then they obviously went. And then the president at the time, Patrick Hillary, didn't attend the Ireland-Australia game yeah. the following November, again by way of protest. Obviously, several players didn't go. Uh, Hugh McNeil, Donald Spring, Tony Ward, um, and a few others uh, didn't go. But it was incredibly contentious. And this uh, the, the Glen Eagles agreement was kind of 1977, mm-hmm. which was a huge number of countries coming together and saying, we can't engage with mm-hmm. South Africa in these terms. Um, yeah, just a line that kind of sticks out here about him. Uh, I often disappeared and explored uh, the townships. Yeah. That I always brought a journalist with me just in case anything went wrong. I've read that line a few times. <laughs> I mean, uh, naturally, we're the sort of people who you you want if something goes wrong in the townships. You <laughs> yes. know, uh, uh, you know the, what I need be. I need a journalist beside me at all times <laughs> when those things are going on. Yeah, sure. Um, um, well, it's one part of the interview anyway. Um, I was curious to know if you felt there was any. Um, strengthen that argument, but clearly not, given the climate at the time. Mm. He talks about the amateur days as well. He's drinking six point, pints the night before a game? Yeah, six pints the night before, and, and no bother on them, apparently, you know. Um, well, I guess the whole thing that comes through is the rugby guys do what the rugby guys want to do, you know, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of just justify it. I mean, uh, he also gave, gave up the drink. He said, um, yeah. uh, it, it, he said uh, the six pints would have zero impact the following day. Uh, he said, I wouldn't have done it otherwise. I could drink forever. Then 17 years ago, I just gave up al- alcohol. I just had enough. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, He's not a fan of the modern game either. He can't stand the constant one-out bashing. Pass, smash, pass, smash for 27 phases until someone knocks it on. That's boring. Mm. The problem with it is <laughs> that if you watch a video of a, of a rugby match from 40, 50 years ago, it doesn't often make for a pleasant view. And no, you get sucked into a, a highlights reel where the barbarians are turned around, or Welsh are scoring or whatever, and you get selected moments. But there are so much of it was dross. Just manic and dross. Yeah. He does see the skill, the, the skill sets are completely different yeah. now. He does say that. Wasn't Slats involved in the famous try, the famous uh, try against the, the Babas? No, for the Babas. For the Babas against he was um, yeah. whoever they were playing, 
Remember the legendary try with that Gareth Ed- from the end of the world. Yeah, yeah. Is it that one? Oh no, that's the that's the French one. Uh, there are a few tries from the, the, the most famous that used to be on the, f- the start of Grandstand you know right. the, uh, the most Gareth Edwards yeah. scored in the corner it was this uh, extraordinary try but Slats was in there wasn't he and that you know it, it was like uh, uh, you know the the most famous try you, well it, you sh- there is um, those li- Living With Lines series are obviously great and the political Discussion aside that we've had on that South African Do you tour. Do you have in mind how impressed you are that the Babas? I'm, I'm, I, you know, that you've seen the Babas? No, that I could call them the Babas so easily. No, no I am impressed. But, I am impressed. You know, on that tour in '74 in South Africa, he was a phenomenon. Uh, he really was. It's the footage. He was just outrageously good. And we had Ian McGeegan in here a couple of years ago, and he was just talking about how phenomenal he was at the time. Like he, we're talking about an unbelievable player in his day. Mm. Interestingly, he says um, when kids came along and he had to start working very hard and everything else. He said, uh, from 1975 until 84, I played in third gear. It's just a matter of fact about it, you know. Mm. No, he was a great player. I mean, I, I remember vaguely as a, a kid, like, and he was so distinctive, you know. Uh, at a time when, to me, it just looked like uh, 50 or 30 people having a fight. Like, uh, you could still see this kind of individual mm. flying around the place with hair, uh, with long hair and stuff like that, you know. So, he, like, he was clearly great player mm. that's, so that's in the Sunday Times is there anything else that anyone wants to direct people towards there's um, a piece on Castor Semenya which is like it's really complicated stuff yeah. and it's generally better done in the hands of like a Ross Tucker or someone on who really knows what they're talking about but basically uh, the Semenya decision um, is up for um, it was appealed and it's going to be decided this week, basically. Um, in short, Semania, Semania and the South African Athletics Association have appealed to CAS and the case is going to be heard this week and it's going to have huge ramifications for women's sport. Uh, David Walsh is writing in favour of uh, restoring the rule whereby uh, Semania and others who are, are in a similar boat to her have to take um, suppressants for the level of t- testosterone in their body. Interestingly, Martina Narvadilova, it's in the... Sunday Times online as opposed to in the paper for whatever reason she's arguing against it she's saying you know we shouldn't be interfering at all with uh, the natural production of testosterone in any athletes um, Ross Tucker's been on the show talking about it a few times before it's an unbelievably complicated area and you're into science that very few of us can get our heads around but they're going to make a, what will be close to a final decision on it uh, this week, so that's actually really worth looking out for, and you can read Devin Walsh uh, talking about it today. And then, I mean, the next frontier is, and several people in the IAAF have mentioned it, that there there may well have to be a transgender um, division very, very soon as well, in the next five to ten years, uh, maybe sooner. So it's very complicated business. I, I'm sure the scientists out there will be interested in that. I don't know, you either are you on top of it or following it closely? No. Uh, That's fair I, enough. I, I couldn't I won't say put either. You on the spot. I couldn't say either. Yes, to either of those questions. Yeah. Um, and again, it, 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 very briefly, it's it's something that doesn't just sit in the world of sport. This is a wider societal issue, as well. And and um, in terms of sport, though, the medicalization of sport in general, and the role of drugs in sport, and all the testing that goes on, and everything that this throws up, it's again not entirely unrelated. To that, and just as it is with I, with with the with the rules around identity and who you who you play for, this is again exceptionally difficult to legislate for yeah. around the margins. And except in this case, and in cases like this, it's it cuts right to the core of of a person's identity. Mm. It goes way beyond something as 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 comparatively superficial as national identity. Mm. But your very core of your being, the essence of, of your humanity, is revealed in this. Mm. Yeah. Um, it's on the back page of the Sunday Times if you want to get started reading on it. And there's going to be a decision this week. But to be honest, this is the latest in a long line of situations where uh, Semenya came on the scene and she beat everybody around her. And then the IAAF uh, said that females with male levels of testosterone could not compete in women's races. And that was in uh, 2015. And that, so then she had a year or two where she wasn't winning races and then that was appealed and it was overturned and then she's had a period where she has been winning races and now it's been overturned again. Where they are at the moment basically is that uh, CAS have asked the IAAF to go away and to come back and prove just how important testosterone is when it comes to performance. Um, that's the kind of real layman's version. Um, now Ross Tucker said it's ludicrous they were asked to do this because it's so obvious that testosterone plays a massive role. but. 
Um, the IAAF are going to go and make their case, but equally South Africa are appealing to CAS as well. So uh, it's very legal as well. And I, the problem people seem to have, or the difficulty, is where do you draw the line? And it becomes um, unbelievably complicated. I think we'll leave it to people who know more about it than us. Uh, we'll do something about it on the show this week. Anything else you want to point anyone towards as we begin to wrap up? Well, isn't this the big uh, test for Ole Gunnar? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, back page there of the um, Sunday World are saying he has the job, that um, Edward met with him for three hours and that um, his people are saying they're pretty confident they have it. Obviously, there's Chelsea tomorrow and Liverpool to come next week, but uh, he seems to think regardless of what happens there, mm. he's going to have the job now, but who knows? Yeah, I haven't made up my mind about that one yet, um, but I marginally favour uh, them, you know, Gunner being the, the new boss. I As think. a Liverpool fan, he wants to see them implode, or just speaking neutrally? Yeah, here? of course. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You think Solskjaer shouldn't get it? Then? There's something about him and is it Michael Carrick sitting beside him? Uh, I know there's something. I find something reassuring about that that I can't quite put my finger on. You know? <laughs> As a Liverpool fan. Yeah. Okay. It was very very see Phil Neville sitting beside Moisey. I know some. I had never felt reassured by anything about Man in the time of Ferguson, but something strangely reassuring. What the one thing I fear on this is that when I see Ole Gunnar there, what I really see is Ferguson. Yeah, Mike, you know uh, I mean? Mike feeling. Mm. Uh, like, um, it, did Ferg did Fergie say something like, uh, you know, uh, what a great job he's doing, or? That yeah, I think he he made some endorsement of him. It's, it's, well, I don't know if he's yeah. done it publicly, but behind the scenes, uh, yeah. they're saying here in this piece by Ken Lawrence Ferguson is absolutely of the um, opinion it should be Solskjaer. Yeah, uh, so that's that's the one bit that that I'm slightly kind of concerned about, you know, because <laughs> really their only solution is to have Fergie back again. Yeah. So the near maybe the nearest thing to it makes you feel better. Ferguson also said they Paul? should have Moyes. I I I think this is again. The very fact of having this conversation is the ultimate proof mm -hmm. that Man United have turned into post-1992 Liverpool. The series of mistakes that Liverpool made, the, the as you say, running down the academy or the mm -hmm. not producing players, Liverpool brought a, su a succession of some of the most mediocre defenders who were matched only by the mediocrity of their midfielders during this period. And you can just see United going exactly down the mm -hmm. same road. What was the name of the Brazilian? Was it Emerson? The Man United bought in the... In the Somewhere. Anderson. Yeah. Anderson. Uh, no, so, like this so summer, the guy, yeah. the guy who bought, they bought this summer. We haven't seen. Oh, yeah. We haven't seen him yeah. In, yeah. in months. He's he seems to be. To it, it's just an odd thing with a club that happened with Liverpool, which is that just once a club becomes dysfunctional. Yeah. It tends to sort of you know it can't stand up for falling down. Mm. It, it just some weird thing gets into the system that you know so you so you start turning down Peter Schmeichel and turning away Eric Cantona and yeah. uh, turning down John O'Shea and it just seems to kind of be the, the, the kind of, you know, uh, all the great decisions that were made seem to always turn into bad decisions. So, uh, Not that money cures everything, but I did almost suspect that United wouldn't quite go all the way down to the Liverpool level. The parallel is definitely there, but just that being the richest club in the world or there, thereabouts yeah, yeah. would insulate them somehow. But it doesn't seem to be the case. You still need really good decisions to be made. And I don't think it would matter so much if turning down Peter Schmeichel or turning down it wouldn't matter so much if you were getting 95% of the rest of the stuff right yeah sure but with Man United I mean they've made a succession of like some of the players they bought like Rojo has a good World Cup for Argentina yeah. next thing he's he's in the Man United squad that's I mean, classic Liverpool that's El Hadji Juf you know exactly uh, so uh, and uh, you know again boiling things down to the simplest all that's happened at Liverpool in the last few years they just stopped signing bad players you know they've signed really good players most of them have turned out really well yeah. and it's as simple as that you know uh, and all more or less all the players United have signed have in some way failed or been of, or have got worse, uh, got dramatically worse, uh, uh, and and it's just a weird thing. It just when, when when things start going like that, they tend to keep going like that. Uh, now it's been six years, and maybe they're due to to Turn kind of stop going like because you just as you say they're so powerful and they've got so much money. Yeah, that, can uh, cover over a lot of bad mistakes. Nothing. Yeah, that they they can turn around. But still, fellas, thanks a million for coming in. So we had uh, Paul Rouse from the School of History at UCD, author of Sport in Ireland History as well, and former Offaly manager. We can say that, can't we? That's fine. No, we can, yeah. And Declan Lynch as well from the Sunday Independent, author of Tony Ten, which as we mentioned at the very top, is out in paperback form sometime around Cheltenham. Gents, thanks a million, we'll take a break. Off the Ball, on News Talk.
Lunchtime Live. Thousands of you have been pounding the pavements every single day since January 1st right around the country, particularly in Cork. Which is why we want to mark day 50 with a walk open to all at The Lock. Let's come together and walk together this Tuesday evening, the 19th of February, and celebrate making it halfway to our goal. Lunchtime Live with Kira Kelly. For full details and to register, go to newstalk.com forward slash 100 days of walking. For the Takumi Master Craftsman at Lexus, perfection is an obsession, and the pursuit of it, a relentless journey that doesn't end. It's why our Lexus SUV, the NX, is built with self-charging hybrid technology, reducing your emissions without compromising on performance to prepare you for a changing world. Nothing is crafted like a Lexus. Test drive the NX and a range of self-charging hybrid SUVs at your Lexus retailer, where you can now choose from a range of 191 offers for a limited time. Lexus. Experience amazing. You think just because I'm pregnant, I'm not up to it. You don't know me. I've got motivation like you wouldn't believe. There is no way I'm going to let my baby grow up in a world like this. I've seen what it's like and I know where it's headed. That's why we're getting out of here. Racing our way free. And you better not get in our way. Curfew, a Sky Original production, starts 22nd of February on Sky One. <laughs> Mommy, Daddy, 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 get, get up, up, get up. up! We're going to the park, remember? <laughs> Daddy isn't feeling very well. Mommy isn't either. Not again. Why don't you go watch some cartoons? We'll be down in a minute. Okay. God, it was great crack, but it's so not worth it. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely drinking less next time. Alcohol can affect your mood and your energy levels. Drink less and you'll have more time to spend with those you love. Find out more at askaboutalcohol.ie from the HSE. Dreaming of a sunny beach break? Fly Air Arabia direct to Agadir, Morocco's premier sun destination. Flights from Dublin start at €59 one way, including taxes. Book at airarabia 